So I'm going to walk you through how I make one of my pulp paintings. And I've always told myself I'm gonna do this from scratch, from beginning to end, and then the painting starts to take off and I forget to check in. So this time I'm going to be much more diligent. So I will start by sharing that this is the uh, base sheet of what will become the painting. And it's actually a sheet that I made in my beater, my pulp beater, which is over here. That's my Hollander beater. And a Hollander beater is named after the water wheels of Holland. Um, and it looks like this. And I beat the pulp in this beater for about 20 hours until it gets you know, so until the fibers open up and the, pa the paper will become very strong as a result of beating in that beater. I do have other videos of the beater and explanations of the beater if you want to watch those. So once the pulp is done in the beater, I pour it onto what is called a, um, a vacuum table. And you can see that the vacuum table has screening on it. This is the kind of screening you can get still at Home Depot or Lowe's or one of these, you know, Ace hardware, something like that. It's not as plentiful as it used to be. Um, it used to be that you could buy this, you know, it was very available, but now they still carry it, but it's not as common. So you will have to ask them for egg crating. That's what you're looking for. They used to use it in the ceilings of commercial um, uh, elevators. So it comes 24 by 48 inches. And uh, again, you can get it at any major uh, hardware store, uh, home improvement store. And then on top of the egg crating, I have fiberglass screening. And so the pulp is actually poured onto the fiberglass screening and the extra water will fall through the egg crating and I just fold over the edges of the screening to form the sheet, the size sheet that I'm trying to make. This is an important step. The next step is I lay out on the sides of the pulp a very thin dripping stream, if you will, of overbeaten abaca which has been immersed in Torora or Formation Aid. And I do that as I'm laying down the base sheet. This is gonna be called the base sheet. The reason I do that, and then I, I, this again is laid down on the egg crating, which is on the screening, is because it's going to dry faster and it's going to hold the paper down nice and smooth onto the egg crating, onto the fiberglass and then the egg crating so that when I'm ready to paint, it's actually stuck to the um, fiberglass and that's stuck to the egg crating. And this prevents shrinkage, it prevents warping as I'm working on the piece. This has been a very important discovery of mine, the importance of laying down a stream of overbeaten abaca <clears throat> that's immersed in from Formation Aid. And I add a, a glop of, of PVA glue to that as well. And it just holds the paper so nicely. And then when the paper dries, again, it's so nice and smooth. So for those of you who are not familiar with um, the material I use, this is abaca. This is from the inner bark of the banana tree. I get my materials from Arnold Brummer or Carriage House or Twin Rocker. I use, I use all three of those distributors evenly. Lee McDonald made, built my beater. <clears throat> Many of you know Lee McDonald. Abaca is from the inner bark of the banana tree, and it's an extremely strong fiber. You cannot rip it when it's dry. I know this looks like corrugated cardboard, but that's just the way it's manufactured. I found out recently that abaca was used in the manufacturing of PPE during the pandemic. It's a plant that um, grows common in the Philippines, 
And there's a startup company in the Philippines called Fibex Corporation that's promoting the uses of abaca worldwide as a material that can actually restore wetlands and could be used as a replacement for fibers used in car manufacturing. So like when they're using uh, fiberglass fiber, which is more pollutant, um, can they substitute that with, with abaca fiber? And Mercedes-Benz is actually looking into that. So it's very exciting for me to know that this wonderful material which has been historically used for parchment paper, for rigging, for sailboats, for tea bags, is now being used in contemporary times for medical supplies and car manufacturing. But I will continue to use it as my painting medium and swear by it. It is the most wonderful medium to use for painting with pulp if you have a Hollander beater. I don't know if I would recommend going so far to use Abaca if you don't have a Hollander, because the nucleus, the, the cell of, of, a, of the fiber, of Abaca fiber, the cell wall is very thick. It's very, it's a, you know, it's a thick cell wall. And the only way to get into the cell wall so that the fiber will work for you as a painting medium, in other words, when you break open the cell wall and you get into the nucleus of the cell, that's when your pigment will, will find the nucleus and will become light fast. Um, so your pigments will be very strong, very colorful. If you don't have a Hollander beater, I don't know if it's worth uh, going through the effort to beat Abaca because you have to beat it for at least 10 hours to get it to really work for you. A blender will not do the same thing. A blender will not open up the cell wall. It'll disperse the fibers, but it won't open up the cell wall. So I don't know if I would recommend using Abaca in your painting unless you have a Hollander or if you're willing to buy it from, say, Carriage House or Twin Rocker or Arnold Grummer. But at any rate, we are going, this sheet was made with Abaca. You can use cotton, cotton will work, um, but Abaca, I do prefer Abaca. So the image we're gonna make is this beautiful sunrise image over a um, field in my town. And we're going to, I'm going to show you how I go paint this image onto this paper. First thing I do is like every Art 101 student, I'm gonna grid the image, and then I'm going to grid the paper so that they match. And then I'm gonna draw the image onto the paper um, like a you know background rough draft. So I will be doing that now and I'll see you on the other side. Okay, so I have gridded my base sheet and you can see that I've gridded the photographs. I'm using two photographs, they're very, very similar and I'm just not sure exactly which one I want. I'll probably end up combining uh, elements of both. So you see that I've gridded it and I've color-coded the photograph to match the base sheet. In other words, the green that is uh, the green color on the photograph, which is at the, let's say the whole numbers, and then the red is at the half numbers, will match the gridding system in the base sheet. I only put the green down for now because right, what I'm gonna be doing today is I'm going to be laying down the basic colors, the blues, yellows, just the fundamental colors. So it's not worth my time to go into deep detail with the gritting system here. I only need the greens for today, but eventually I will be using the reds and the blacks as well. And sometimes I get a bit to more colors, blues and browns, if it really becomes very detailed. So anyway, that's what I've done. And now it's time to take the overbeaten abaca and add the colors and start making the palette that will become, you know, obviously the painting palette for the painting. So I will start doing that and I'll be right back. Okay, so here we are at the very famous overbeaten pulp mixing station. The overbeaten pulp will look like this. It looks almost like orange juice pulp, but just a much whiter color. And I put it in the blender, and then I fill the blender with 
a mixture of water and PVA glue. In other words, when the PVA glue bottle, which I buy in gallons, is almost empty, I just fill it with water and shake it and use that gluey water um, to mix my Abaca <clears throat> with the formation aid. So the formation aid, very helpful to have a Parmesan cheese bottle on hand. Works great. Um, the formation aid is a synthetic of it's a synthetic of Torora. Torora is a berry from Japan that is very goopy. It's from, it's a it's from the family of the mulberry tree, and it's just very goopy. And it it when you add the Torora, which I get in a powder format again from Twin Rocker, Carriage House, or Arnold Grummer paper, um, you add it to the abaca, the overbeaten abaca. This abaca has been beaten for twenty hours in my Hollander beater, so it's very um it's just like syrup at this point but wait till you see what it looks like when it's dry it's just the most wonderful material i add the formation aid to the abaca and the gluey water this is one of those wonderful old blenders that's been around since probably the 30s a friend of mine gave it to me when her father-in-law moved out of his house how much do you blend? How much do you add? You'll just have to play with it. I am not a measurer. I don't measure anything. Um, you want the feel of it when it gets out of the blender to be very goopy. As it sits, it will become increasingly um, gelatinous. So if it's a little bit on the watery side, you'll probably want that because if it's if you think it's the perfect consistency by the time it's dry, or drier, like after a few hours of sitting, it might be a little bit too goopy, almost like um, Play-Doh instead of a nice flowing material. So I'm just gonna blend this for a second. Okay, so now what I'm gonna show is how I pigment the pulp. So I've made the overbeaten, just to refresh. Um, I peated for about 20 hours. Then I added the Torora, the formation aid in the blender with the gluey water. And now what I've done is I've taken that out of the blender and you can see it's a nice consistency. It's very like jello or pudding, a little bit runnier than pudding. If it's like pudding, it might be a little bit too thick for us. So this is a perfect consistency of what we're looking for. And then I'm going to try to make up the colors that will be the basics for this painting. One thing about overbeaten abaca, using it as a painting material, if you have wet colors, I think of you know clothes coming out of the washing machine and going into the dryer, they're darker than when they're gonna be when they dry. It's the opposite with abaca. It actually dries darker than the color is when it's wet. And I think the reason for that is because the cell of the plant, when you beat it in the beater and it opens up and you end up with a gelatinous nucleus of the cell, which we call methyl cellulose. So if you've heard of methyl cellulose, which is like a wallpaper paste, that is the cell wall of a plant. It's the methyl in cell. That's what you're doing in a Hollander beater. You're opening up the fiber, the cell wall, and you're, you're basically disintegrating it so that that nucleus of the cell opens up and will, t will hold the fiber. And I think that's why it dries darker because in other words, the fibers are so, um, when that gelatinous dries, when the, when the pulp is wet and so goopy, when it dries, it's gonna be like skin. And I think as that methyl and cellulin dries, the colors, the cell walls come together so tight that each, if each one of those cell walls is holding color and they're getting closer and closer, your colors are gonna get darker, not lighter. It probably takes a little bit to figure that out, but that's what makes sense to me. So anyway, I have to be aware of the fact that as I add the color, the, the colors will be darker, not lighter when they dry. So with that in mind, I'm gonna make up I'm going to make some uh, orange and a little bit of, just a little bit of the pigment will do the trick. 
I get the pigments from Carriage House or Twin, Ro Twin Rocker or Arnold Grummer. And I'll have those uh, links uh, at the end of the video so you can contact them for any of these materials we're using. And uh, follow them on social media. Um, all right, so we've got the orange, you see? And I'm not gonna, I'm not trying to match the colors perfectly when I um, begin the um, palette. I'm just trying to make up the basics of the palette. So I'm gonna continue doing that now. Okay, so we're coming along with our painting. And I wanna show you something I'm going to be doing. If you look at this area here, of the photograph, right? You'll see it's kind of, there's this pink and purple right around here. So what we're gonna do is this area here, I'm just gonna dribble a little bit of the pink and a little bit of the purple, okay? And then just using my simple spoon, I'm gonna pull them through the the pulp through the painting and so that they become streaks of pink and purple. And one tool I like to use to do this is actually old credit cards. And you can start to see those streaks finding their way through the, the painting just by using the flat side of this credit card. It just has a really nice look to it. And, you know, this is again all the underpainting, so a lot of this will end up getting covered over. But it's, uh, you know, it's a good start. The colors in the painting are very nice. They're also simple, so we don't have a particularly complicated composition here, which is great because the painting I just finished, the cone flowers, whew, there's a lot of flat colors in that. So that took me quite a while, probably a couple months to finish those two paintings. So this one should go a little faster, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. So you can see what I'm doing. And, you know, if all else fails, you can always use your fingers, right? Here we go. And here we go. We can we can start to play with some of these streaky colors. Okay. Okay, so we're working into the sky area here and these lovely streaks of color from orange and pink and red and yellow and all the way up to uh, the blues at the top. Just such beautiful colors. I'm a professor of architecture interior design as well as being an artist and for a long time, uh, design didn't have a lot of color, and color is definitely coming back into the design world, and I'm very happy to see it. One wonders that with all the pandemic and other things we've been dealing with, that uh, subconsciously we're all looking for a little more color in our lives. So you can start to see colors in uh, design. We're even starting to see wallpaper make a comeback, which we haven't seen wallpaper on walls in years, but increasingly we're starting to see the potential for the wall itself to take on more of a active role in the design rather than being a reciprocal of uh, artwork or, you know, other um, sub-traits on the wall. So the wall itself can, is coming back as a, as, a in, as a design property. So that's good. Okay, and now we're gonna add the background 
really misty color. And notice how I'm not blending these colors. I just took some of this green um, and some of the colors that I'd been gathering um, from when they, when they ran down the side, I just grabbed them and put them in this cup. And in doing so, by collecting all those colors, I'm pretty much guaranteed that any shadows I put into the painting, if I use those colors, I'm, I'm, I'm incorporating all the colors of the painting into the shadows. And that works much better than using gray as a shadow because the colors from the painting will gray out as you blend them because you're blending cool colors and warm colors. So they're gonna gray out, but it will give you a nice shadow, shade color that's made up of the rest of the palette of the painting and not a, just some arbitrary gray, which isn't gonna be nearly as rich as using you know these blends of colors. So that's what we're doing now. Okay, so now I'm continuing to work on the background shading, which is the mist. And it's just this kind of nondescript color. If you look at it, it's hard to gauge exactly what color it is. I've learned to just put something down that I think is close. And in this case, we have a little bit of a peach over here and it becomes an olive. So for the first layer, I'm just gonna put that down and I'll worry about getting it more exact, um, you know, later on. Um, but I just wanna get something down for now and let it dry overnight. Okay, we're gonna keep adding these streaks of color to the left side of the piece in particular. And again, just bear in mind that in a, in a, basically all of this will be covered up as we move through the painting. But we're just getting the palette down and some of the composition, some of the rhythm of the piece. And it's just important to lay the groundwork without getting too, um, you know, carried away of making everything look exactly right. Oftentimes the, the most stunning thing about a final painting is the mistakes you made along the way or the accidents, we call them the happy accidents, where you're trying, you're not trying to be so careful and you're, you're not uh, trying to get too overwhelmed with the control. You want the painting to kind of take on a life of its own. It's kind of like an author when you're writing a book. You want the characters to start to merge out of the novel and start telling the author what they need to do, you know, as they start becoming more and more lifelike. So you'll notice we're not, um, you know, we're not doing any detail yet. We're not going into one area of the painting and making too many marks. We don't want to do that. We want to keep it really fresh. Um, we're way too early to be, um, you know, doing anything definitive at this point. I think that's another thing that young artists have to understand. You have to look at the whole piece first and get a sense of what the whole composition wants to do before you move into anything more specific. So that's what we're doing here. All right, and again, some really nice things will start to emerge when we let the painting take on a little bit of a life of its own. When we don't, don't try to do too much in fact, like over here, I can see this nice gold orange look and I'm thinking, huh, that's kind of like what I have in my hand. So I'm going to just drop it in here and see, you know, what happens. Um, it'll all be covered up 
pretty much in the end, but it gives us an idea of what this color will do in that area of the painting. And, you know, we're just gonna kind of blend it in and just see where we go with this. You know, so there's gonna be some nice things that merge from this little trial here. And what we don't like, we can just cover it up, so. Okay, so here we're, okay, we're going to put the last of the, like these stripes, you know, so we can see these stripes and the last of like this reddish brown, we're going to put on the front of it now. And again, I don't really have to worry too much about the, um, you know, the, the composition because I know that this is all going to end up in the background. So I'm just going to keep laying down my colors and I can see that it's a little bit too um, green, right? So I am going to add some of the rust color. Especially up here at the top of the where the wall is going to end up going, I can add some more of the rust and be confident that that's going to be fine. And I'm going to use my credit card for this because it's just such a big area. I might as well, I'm just going to waste time using the spoons. So I'll use the credit card. And I'm going to turn a fan on this for overnight so that it, um, so that it dries. And then in the morning I can look at where, what I have and start working into it a little more carefully. And I, I think of the overbeaten as kind of precious, you know, because it takes so long to make it. So I don't want to waste any. So that's why I keep collecting it when it gets to the end of the painting. Um, and I put it back in the container because it, it is expensive. I mean, relatively speaking, you know, so I, I make sure that I don't waste any of it. Okay. And here's, I'm going to pick the rest of it up. What's going to happen, obviously, is we're kind of getting a new color, right, than the one we, because we've just blended three colors. So what I'll do is I'll just look for a color on the table that's the, is closest to the one that I've just made. And then I'll just pour the pulp in. I don't um, blend it. Um, cause I don't want to, um, you know, oftentimes I'll have to actually use that as same color first thing in the next morning. So I don't blend it in. I just know that if I look at enough of the jars, I'll find that the color I'm looking for. So one thing I have to remember, I don't tend to use all these spoons. <laughs> I put all these spoons in them and then I tend to use one or two. So I stop getting all these spoons so messy. So basically that's the end of the first day. We have now the background of our painting, you see? And um, it's going to 
you know, it's gonna, it, we can see that the background is here and when it dries and we come back tomorrow, we can continue to work into it. So that's the end of the first day of painting this painting. And I wanna thank you for joining me. So tomorrow we'll keep working.